from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, it is the biggest acquisition ever for Square and one of the biggest tech deals of the year. Square agreeing to buy Australia's Afterpay in a $29 billion deal. Why they're pushing into the buy now, pay later business that young consumers are flocking to. Plus, crypto platform Fireblocks locks in new funding at a $2 billion va valuation, making unicorn status official. Our conversation with CEO Michael Shalov about how crypto volatility is impacting strategy. And mask mandates are slowly creeping back. Facebook joining the list of companies requiring employees to mask up. How the return to work process is shifting as we speak. All that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets with our own Kriti Gupta and U.S. equities finishing the day in the red. Kriti, walk us through the day. Well, Emily, it was a risk-off day in the markets that you saw, and you really saw the S&P 500, like you said, ending in the red. Tech outperformance, that's where all the money really went. You can see even the NASDAQ ending flat on the day, but big tech, that New York FANG index, that's really where all the money went, that safe haven bid right there, as well as into treasuries, the yield down four basis points. But even with that kind of big tech outperformance, when you see big tech really outperform like it did today, you start to see semiconductors do it as well, actually hitting a record today. If you actually pull up a chart, you can see even though the semiconductors did pull up uh, or did hit a record, I should say, it did with a lot less momentum. So the question here is, can they really keep those record levels? Can that momentum really sustain when there isn't that much conviction behind it? Those are the questions surrounding semiconductors. But now that we've got the macro out of the way, Emily, I want to get to the micro. And this, of course, brings me to the deal of the day. Square looking at Afterpay for a $29 billion acquisition. Now, what's interesting here is what the stocks actually did. Because in a situation like this, the acquirer, in this case Square, would actually see their stock drop. And the acquiree, for lack of a better term, Afterpay, would see their stock store and this is kind of what you saw to some extent after pay up 35 percent those are the adrs those u.s listed shares of the australian company but look even square actually up 10 percent so this is a deal that got some approval from all investors regardless of what stock you were in all right pretty thanks so much for that roundup i want to stick with square now the largest acquisition ever for that company the digital payments platform of course led by Jack Dorsey, also the CEO of Twitter. Square has agreed to acquire the Australian buy now, pay later company Afterpay, the deal $29 billion. Square says it's capitalizing on a shift away from traditional credit, especially among younger consumers. Joining us to discuss, Lisa Ellis of Moffitt Nathanson, who currently has a buy rating on the company. And Lisa, you say the deal is strategically compelling for Square. Why do you feel that way? The key thing for uh, Square is it Afterpay brings them this ecosystem, like you said, of younger consumers that really like this alternative form of credit. And they've got a really compelling two-sided network of merchants and consumers, a very strong two-sided value proposition, which is like the holy grail in payments that creates this big competitive moat if you've got two sides lining up. And Square currently has merchants and they have consumers, but the two pieces aren't really connected. The key strategic benefit for Square is that they are, they are now able to connect their two ecosystems of merchants and, and consumers and start to look a lot more like somebody like a PayPal, you know, that's got a very balanced uh, type of, of model or type of model. Um, in addition to that, Afterpay helps Square significantly with expanding outside the U.S., which is another big growth area for Square. Okay, but $29 billion is a lot of money, and Square is a $125 billion company. Is the price tag worth it? Yeah, it's actually a pretty reasonably priced deal. I think that's why you saw the positive reaction in both stocks today. The right valuation metric with these kinds of companies is something like an EV enterprise value to gross profit type of ratio. And on that basis, the deal was priced somewhere in the mid 30s. Square is actually currently trading in the high 20s, so it's not actually that different. And Afterpay's growth has been almost 100% year on year. So, you know, valuation wise, um, you know, they're both high flyers, if you know what I mean. Like, and it's an all stock deal. So it actually, uh, 
looks pretty attractive from um, from a valuation perspective as well. What does this mean for the buy now, pay later alternatives? We've reported that Apple is getting into this business with Apple Pay and Goldman Sachs. You mentioned PayPal. There's a firm. There's Klarna. Who does this mm. threaten the most? Yeah, it's definitely so. Again, a big strategic part of the deal, and, and why why Square was actually able to get Afterpay at the valuation they were is because Afterpay and other pure plays like a firm in Klarna have been facing a lot of pressure from PayPal, from Apple even like American Express or getting into this business. And if you look back over the last few months, their stocks have actually not done very well as a result of that. So Square is helping them beef up. If we're going to see uh, that um, other, you know, what we'd expect to see. So this is mostly competitive for PayPal. It starts to create an alternative to PayPal that starts to approach the scale. It's almost like a, a validation of PayPal strategy, so to speak, because Square is taking a lot of steps to build an offering that's more similar to PayPal. Um, but in addition to that, if you look at other stocks today, like a firm, for example, was up 15 or 16 percent today. That's because it's now expected that those other pure play players like a firm or Klarna are likely acquisition targets themselves. All right, Lisa Ellis of Moffitt Nathanson, good to have you with us. We'll be following how the deal plays out. Meantime, China's securities regulator has called for talks with its American counterpart after the U.S. SEC increased disclosure requirements for IPOs of Chinese companies amid a nearly $1 trillion share sell-off last week. Part of that sell-off was due to Kathy Wood's exit from Tencent and the property site KE Holdings. For more on ARC and this latest move, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld. Katie, so much happening in this space and amazing that ARC could have such an impact um, on you know, these latest moves by the Chinese government. Give us some uh, broader context here. Exactly. Well, it is pretty interesting that ARC was kind of ahead of the game here. They started offloading Chinese equities earlier in July before the real flood of crackdown headlines. And if you look across their ETF lineup, the ARC Innovation ETF, that's ARC's biggest ETF, it has zero exposure to China right now. It was 8% of its portfolio in February. It's a similar story with the ARC Next Generation, Next Generation Internet ETF. No exposure to China. That was 9% earlier this year. And so this was kind of surprising to see them really offload their Chinese equities because we heard in a July 13th webinar from ARC that the regulatory changes have not fundamentally impacted the Chinese companies that they invest in. But it's going to be interesting to hear if that language changes at all, especially since they're pretty much out of China at this point. Where do ARC's funds stand on Chinese equities in general now? In general, not a lot of exposure, even again in that ARC Next Generation Internet ETF. And Kathy Wood had been bull pretty bullish on China because there is a lot of innovation happening there, but they haven't commented really publicly on why they're offloading these shares. But I mean, if you just look at the sweeping crackdowns, just the broad nature of the different sectors that they're targeting, maybe the uncertainty around whether that would be a viable place to put money caused them to pull some out. So to recap, uh, the Chinese government trying to step up communication with the SEC after the SEC said it'll suspend any Chinese IPOs until companies improve their disclosures. But of course, that was kicked off by the Chinese uh, government and, and moves that they, uh, the Chinese government has made. How are international investors in general responding to this crackdown? There's still a lot of caution, even though maybe we might see some dialogue. And even last week, by the end of last week, after that dramatic uh, crackdown on the private education sector on Monday, by the end of the week, you saw Chinese state media trying to urge calm. Chinese regular, regulators said to be meeting with banks. But still, even with all that, nearly a trillion dollars was wiped out of Chinese equity markets last week. And there's really two ways to look at this. An optimist would look at these valuations and say, this is a buying opportunity. But most of the investors that I speak to are thinking, it's unknowable that whether, to know whether this is the extent of the crackdown or if there's still more to come. So that could be capping the rebound that we've started to see in Chinese equities. Because if you look at the Golden Dragon Index, it's still down over 40 percent since its February peak. OK, something we will definitely continue to follow. Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld, thanks so much for that update.
All right, coming up, Bitcoin drops after posting its biggest weekly gain in three months. We're going to tell you what's driving the latest crypto market moves next. And take two interactive falling in extended trade after saying several key titles will be delayed. The news coming as the video game maker delivered its quarterly results. Recurring consumer spending fell 25% in the first quarter as the game business continues to show weakness after a surge in play during the early phase of the pandemic. However, that was better than the anticipated 30% decline. We'll keep watching this one. This is Bloomberg. Let's get a check on crypto markets. Bitcoin pulling back to around $40,000 after climbing over the weekend to the highest level since May. Our Ed Ludlow has more. Ed, what do you think is driving this? Yeah, market participants seem to be suggesting that this is just a pullback from what was a pretty steep rise in a short space of time. Of course, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin trade over the weekend. So Sunday we hit 42,650 on Bitcoin. We've pulled back now below 40,000. We've spilled into Tuesday's session already because of the trading hours, but broadly, cryptocurrencies were lower. Come with me into my Bloomberg terminal, though, and take a look at this chart because that pullback that I'm talking about has brought us back into the trading range of recent weeks. You see there the orange box on the right, right hand side. The volatility that we saw in April and May, that steep decline in mid-May, we've traded in a much more narrow range. We're now back in the top of that range between 30,000 and 40,000 US dollars. It leaves strategists asking, what does this mean? I don't know what it means, but they, they don't know what it means either. So it's just one to watch going forward. As you know, Emily, when I come up here and we talk about a, a sort of steep drop suddenly in a cryptocurrency, we then look to crypto related stocks because they usually follow suit. It was interesting. We didn't really get that on Monday's trading session in US equities. Marathon up by 2%, Coinbase a little lower, half a percent, and Riot blockchain up by around 1.5%. So there's not such a close correlation right now between cryptocurrencies and those crypto related stocks. All right, we'll keep watching. Uh, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, thanks so much. Staying with crypto, leading crypto services provider Fireblocks raised $310 million valuing the company at $2 billion, making its unicorn status official. The company came out of stealth mode in 2019 and now counts the venture capital firm Sequoia and Bank of New York Mellon. Among its investors, Fireblock CEO Michael Shalov joins us now uh, to talk more about the company's vision. So I want to talk to you about the volatility, Michael. But first, talk to us about how Fireblocks works. Where are you in the stack and what use cases are there? Yeah, sure. So. Uh... We basically help people with, uh, or help company and businesses with two things. Uh, one, to provide them a secure custody and storage. So we provide custody technology for clients to store coins and uh, digital assets. The second thing that we do is that we help them to transfer those assets and to sell them in a very efficient and secure way. And the third thing that we do is that we help them with issuance. So basically bring a uh, traditional assets such as, for example, um, digital, uh, uh, sorry, regular currency into stable coins, securities, and so on. So the volatility obviously has been the story of the last few months after soaring to records. Now we're seeing this pullback. How has that impacted you? How has that impacted where you plan to take the company? Yeah, so um, generally speaking, because we actually sit in the settlement layer and because uh, our business model is somewhat tied to the transactional uh, nature, uh, volatility is uh, usually good for us. So in May, that I believe was the most volatile uh, month, it was our record, mo record month. We sold about $180 billion of uh, on-chain transactions, which was just a, a record for us. Uh, but, you know, overall, we're just seeing the activity around cryptocurrency and around digital assets increasing continuously. So, of course, there is sort of the, the volatility in the market. But if you look at the trend, uh, the amount of participants, the amount of volume, the amount of transaction just continues to increase. Also, the amount of uh, unique wallets uh, continues to increase. And that uh, is just journey uh, speaks to the adoption or the propagation of this technology into the um, general market, into the into the mass uh, institutional market. So speaking of security, obviously it's very important when you've got these private keys involved. You're being sued by a staking company, StakeHound, over $76 million in Ether. They say you lost. They claim that you deleted the private keys and then didn't back them up. 
Can you give us an update on this lawsuit? Yeah, so th this is still uh, being worked out in the court, but uh, I think as we mentioned earlier, unfortunately, this is like a factually incorrect. We didn't lose their keys and they're still uh, still uh, using their wallets. Uh, there was a different experience that was done over there actually around staking uh, in a very experimental side of the, um, of the ecosystem where people are exploring new technologies. And over there, there was a, an issue that was related mostly in terms of how the service was uh, consumed by them and you know obeying the protocols in something that was very exploratory. But something that is probably more important to really stress, I think that generally speaking, um, the technology for custody and securing wallets is really mature. And especially as people are really using the, um, the infrastructure, our infrastructure or competing infrastructure to st store cryptocurrencies, we already know how to do it to make sure that it's protected from insiders, protected from cyber criminals and so on. So, you know, I think stories like this add to the fear that some traditional investors, individual investors have in getting into cryptocurrency. You know, there's this perception like if you lose the private key, <laughs> there's, there's no other option. You lose your money. I mean, how do you sort of quell that kind of fear? Yeah, so I think that there are a couple of, uh, 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 first of all, there was a huge technology investments advancements over the last couple of years where uh, we were basically able to remove the single point of failure and the single point of compromise around the private key. So for example, what Fireblocks does and uh, some of the other company are, are using is a technology that's called MPC or multi-party computation that basically distributes the private key among multiple participants and more among multiple servers that even if one of them basically fails, there is a sufficient amount of redundancy that allows you to, to recover. Um, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is really the fact that there is more and more insurance capacity uh, that uh, allows you to secure this. And I think that the protocols, generally speaking, are well understood. So it's true that uh, this story specifically was a bit uh, described in a, in a way that is, uh, you know, contributes to the misconception, right? But specifically, it will had nothing to do with the wallets or the custody of the technology and much more related to the usage of a, some Ethereum 2 smart contract that was involved over there. Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy, was on the show last week. Obviously, he's one of the most bullish folks on Bitcoin out there. The company uh, you know, has made $1.4 billion in profits on its cryptocurrency on paper, but he says... He's never going to sell. You know, to think about holding Bitcoin like holding prof property, something that you pass down over generations. What do you think of that idea? And how does this space evolve? You know, given that the volatility is still scary for some investors. So I think that there is one um, one question around basically Bitcoin, right? And I think that MicroStrategy was very bullish on, on specifically Bitcoin and uh, the view of Bitcoin as something that is digital gold, right? I think at Fireblocks, what we really looking into is the ability for the technology really to serve a much broader, uh, for, for much broader use cases, right? Around replatforming and innovating um, of uh, just financial infrastructure. So the areas that we are excited about beyond just you know buying Bitcoin as a reserve currency, right, is around digital payments, right? How that innovates uh, uh, and and allow people to do, you know, uh, transatlantic okay. remittance and things like that. You know, digital securities, clearing, and so on. Right. Fireblock CEO Michael Shala, thanks so much for uh, sharing your perspective with us. Obviously, we'll continue to follow. Coming up, Google makes its biggest bet yet on smartphones as it releases details on the Pixel 6 and 6 Pro. Out later this year, the scoop from Mark Gurman. Next, this is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Ehrman with Bloomberg Technology, and on this week's episode of Power On, I'll be taking a look at Google's upcoming Pixel 6 and Pixel 6 Pro phones and how they'll compete with the next generation competitors from Apple and Samsung. For this year, 
Google is making major changes to its devices, and they plan to launch an entry-level model with aluminum edges, as well as a higher-end pro model with a telephoto camera, a bigger screen, and nicer materials. Both devices have new designs with a large camera bar on the back. But the biggest change is on the inside. A new system on a chip called Tensor that replaces the Qualcomm SoC that has been used in Pixel devices for several years. The addition of a new chip means that Google is finally catching up to Apple and Samsung, which have both included their own in-house processors inside their smartphones for several years. Google said that its new Tensor chip will beef up its artificial intelligence capabilities, including in speech recognition speed and accuracy, as well as in the processing of photo and video. Another upgrade coming in this year's Pixel phones is an in-screen fingerprint reader for unlocking the device and authenticating payments. In addition to the new hardware design and revamped internals, the company is also debuting a new Material U user interface for the new Pixel phones. The new interface changes the button as well as interface elements design to color match the phone's wallpaper. The new phones are likely to be announced in October and released later in 2021. The new phones will be critical for Google, which despite releasing well-made devices, has ironically not made a dent into the hardware ecosystem for its own Android operating system. The new phones launch half a decade after the first models back in 2016. For Pixel fans looking for something sooner, the company also plans to debut a new low-cost Pixel 5a phone in August. The new devices will stack up against new foldable phones launching in August from Samsung, as well as Apple's next-generation iPhones launching in September with a smaller notch, faster processor, and much improved cameras. For Power On, I'm Mark Gurman. Don't forget you can sign up for Mark's weekly Power On newsletter at Bloomberg.com. All right, meantime, actress Reese Witherspoon has sold a majority stake in her production company, Hello Sunshine, a deal that highlights the hot market for original movies and TV shows. The buyer is a new but as yet unnamed firm run by former top Disney execs Tom Staggs and Kevin Meyer and backed by the private equity firm Blackstone. Bloomberg has learned the deal values Witherspoon's company, Hello Sunshine, at about $900 million. Hello Sunshine produced shows like HBO drama Big Little Lies and the Apple TV Plus series The Morning Show. All right, coming up, paying from your phone is about to get easier. We're speaking with founder and CEO of Marketa, Jason Gardner, about how his company is powering a brand new commerce feature for Google Pay users. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Pandemic fueled demand for food delivery has helped Singapore's grab post a narrower loss for the quarter. It's the first time the company has reported quarterly financial results as it preps to go public in the U.S. through a SPAC deal. Our Ed Ludlow has more. Ed, what are you watching here? Yeah, when we talk about these SPAC acquired companies, they're usually pre-revenue, right? And their financials are a little ugly. And Grab's kind of different because it's genuinely revenue generating. Remember, it did its SPAC deal in April, valuing the company at 40 billion US dollars, Southeast Asia's most valuable startup. But it hit some snags. The SEC wanted them to change how they report. They had to audit the last three years of earnings. So that's why we've got these numbers. Let's dig into them. It's interesting. They had to change how they took into account customer incentives. We're very familiar with the likes of Uber and Lyft, giving discounts, giving promo codes. But the SEC wanted them to go back and change it. So in the first quarter of this year, a net loss of $652 million, down from more than $770 million a year ago. And you can see that revenue, $216 million in the first quarter. They re it was revised down sharply. For full year 2020 last year, they'd originally reported $1.2 billion of revenue. When it was revised down, it ended up being much, much less, just $469 million. And what about the SPAC itself? I mean, these companies, they have to wait a long time. Originally, the transaction was supposed to close this quarter. It's been pushed back to the fourth quarter. And investors kind of seem to lose patience because between April the 13th, when the deal was finalized, to present day, the stock is down more than 30%. But it still puts Grab on the map. Southeast Asia's most valuable startup. Will it prove to be a success. What they're saying 
is that there's weakness in ride hailing and that there's strength in food delivery. And I thought that that was just an interesting company to bring up ahead of this week where we have Lyft reporting earnings and we have Uber reporting earnings too. Emily. All right, we'll be across all of those as well. Ed, thanks so much. Meantime, the evolving pandemic has heightened the need for contactless payment and mobile wallets. Marketa, a payment processor and card issuer, is capitalizing on the opportunity by giving Google Pay users a new way to buy stuff. Joining me now for more, Marketa founder and CEO Jason Gardner and our Bloomberg News reporter, Shanali Basik in New York. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. So your card issuing platform will power this new uh, Google Play Google Pay Balance Card. Talk to us about how this will work and what is so significant about it. Well, well thank you for having me. And, and as we've seen, the, the tokenization of payment cards, the ability to generate these cards virtually and drop them into Google Pay or Apple Pay or Samsung Pay has really accelerated over the last year and a half. And our uh, partnership with Google allows Google users to spend outside of the Google ecosystem. So to generate uh, these cards, drop them into Google Pay and spend anywhere Google Pay is accepted. So, uh, you know, huge news in the fintech space today with Square buying Afterpay. And I'm curious what you make of all of this consolidation. Well, first of all, it's there are two founder led companies that build beautiful experiences for consumers. They also happen to be both marketed customers, uh, both shining examples of modern card issuing. And we see where not only does every company want to become a fintech company, but there's many flavors of fintech that we're finding where companies are really combining in, in this uh, square buying uh, afterpay. And I can't wait to see what they do together. Buy Now, Pay Later uh, started in Europe. It's now a, a movement uh, in the U.S. We've seen Cash App grow significantly as part of Square. So let's see the beautiful experience that they can create together as a combined entity. I have so many curi uh, curious curiosities about how this plays out and how this changes the credit underwriting. Or, uh, I'm losing my words today. Credit underwriting landscape. But you know, you work with so many of these companies, from Square to Google uh, to even Goldman Sachs. And honestly, I'm really curious, Jason, as to what type of company wins at the end of the day. Is it a fintech company? Is it a big tech company? Or is it a traditional <laughs> Wall Street company that ends up winning this game? The best experience wins. The companies that build the best experience, they listen to their consumers uh, and, and businesses, uh, depending on which flavor of uh, what they're trying to build. But we've seen where companies like Goldman Sachs, a 160-year-old bank reinventing themselves. We've seen companies like Afterpay and Buy Now, Pay Later, or the Cash App, and adding a card to the Cash App, which happened in the beginning of 17, has really transformed banking. The idea of embedding fintech into companies is not a new thing. What's new is really focusing on the consumer experience. And this is happening around the world in towns and cities, countries, continents, really changing the landscape of how fintech or really banking is brought to both consumers and, and, and businesses. So I can't wait to see what happens. I think like most people uh, to see companies like Square and Afterpay combined you're really focused on the outcome. What can these companies do together? And this is a new change in regards to really the fintech landscape and how companies are coming together to build new experiences. Is there anything that folks need to be worried about when it comes to buy now, pay later? Because some of the older Wall Street types, right, the folks that have been around forever, what they're really worried about is the underwriting standards that come with it. We haven't seen a major hiccup yet. We haven't even seen really bad times for the consumers who use it yet. So is there anything you're worried about? Well, interest rates uh, have remained fairly low. Uh, again, we see consumers are really adopting all types of buy now, pay later, whether it's uh, Afterpay, Affirm, Klarna, Zip, QuadPay. There's a number of different firms out there. I think there's approximately 20 or 30 uh, buy now, pay later companies. So consumers have really adopted these. Um, how consumers use this to buy at the point of sale, whether online or offline, I really think will continue. Again, this has started in Europe. It came to the United States, and now it's a global phenomenon. They will continue to use this as long as it's an option for them uh, to buy at the point of sale. 
Jason, how is crypto shaking all of this up? Obviously, now a massive part of Square's business is also crypto. I mean, there's a ton of volatility in the space, not something that crypto loyalists are not used to. However, you know, for more traditional investors, I think there's still a lot of fear out there given continued volatility. Yeah, it's interesting. You asked me that question on June 9th, the day that uh, Marquetta went public. And it was uh, there was a lot of the news because El Salvador had said they're going to legitimize it and allow you to, to spend that. Now, since then, we've seen uh, Janet Yellen talk about stable coins. Again, this is something that we constantly talk about uh, in every country in the world is trying to figure out what we're going to do with it. I think right now we're just in the context of how do we regulate? I think regulation is good. I think it brings legitimacy to currencies, especially in the, in the crypto world. Uh, we see consumers beginning to use it, whether it's uh, crypto rewards as part of credit card products or prepaid products. We obviously seen, uh, as you mentioned, Square uh, getting into the game, the ability to buy crypto and spend crypto. Um, I think it's there is more coming. I think there's a positive aspect of everything that we're doing. Again, this is another currency another currency that consumers are going to use, they're going to spend, also businesses. So there's more to come. I see only positive aspects of this. And the more it gets regulated, the more it legitimizes it and allows consumers, just like you and me, uh, to be able to use crypto as a, as a legitimate mm -hmm. currency at the point of sale. Jason, I want to talk about your path to going public because it looks like your company, so many fintech companies, just started off with this boom and then have wavered a little bit in public markets. You're trading around your IPO price. Are you still happy you went public? And also, what is it about these companies that you think they're getting so much steam at the onset, but then not keeping that momentum into trading? Well, as a founder CEO, you never think about in the beginning that you want to take a company public. We had an, over an 11-year journey. Uh, we spent 18 months in planning to go public. It was time to go public. It was the right time for us to go public. And going public on June 9th was a one-day event. This is a generational business. Stocks go up, stocks go down. We're just focused on building a great business and servicing our customers. One thing I found is after 18 months of running an IPO process, I'm actually really excited to get back to running the business on a day-to-day -day basis and see what we can uh, accomplish as a business, not only as marketing, but also we can do it for our customers around the world. Interesting. And we've seen a similar path looking at the shares of Robinhood, looking at UI path, uh, no pun intended. Uh, so we'll keep following that story and you getting back to business. Jason Gardner, Marketa founder and CEO, as well as our own Shanali Basik. Thank you both. Coming up, companies around the world hitting pause on return to work plans in the midst of the Delta variant. We are looking at striking that delicate balance between digital and physical worlds and how companies are adapting. That's next. And before we head to break, let's take a look at these images from Cape Canaveral in Florida, Boeing Starliner crew capsule and the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket it sits on top of has been rolled out to the launch site again. It is the second time in less than a week that the spacecraft has been positioned ready for takeoff on an uncrewed mission to the International Space Station. Last Thursday's attempt was scrubbed after a Russian module accidentally caused the ISS to tilt as it docked with the outpost. Tuesday's launch expected 1.30 p.m. Wall Street time. And of course, you can catch it right here on Bloomberg Television. This is Bloomberg. We want to strongly recommend that people wear masks in indoor settings, even if you're vaccinated. Now, this is particularly true, of course, if you might be around anyone unvaccinated. If you don't know the people you're around, if you're not sure if they're vaccinated or not, or if you know some are unvaccinated, absolutely crucial to wear a mask, uh, even if you are vaccinated. The difference, of course, is if you're around fully vaccinated people, that's a better situation. 
New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio there. His comments coming just hours before health authorities in California reinstated a mask mandate for San Francisco and surrounding counties. Los Angeles already has new guidelines in place. These recommendations, along with other concerns surrounding the Delta variant, have caused some companies to reevaluate their return to office plans. Companies like Google, Facebook, and Apple have all delayed their reopening plans, citing the rise in COVID cases, with some even requiring proof of vaccination before returning to work. A new book by Stanford's Robert Siegel, The Brains and Brawn Company, how leading organizations blend the best of digital and physical, explores how companies can balance in-person and remote work in a rapidly evolving mid to post-pandemic world. Joining me now for our work shifting segment is the author of that book, lecturer at Stanford Graduate School of Business, Robert Siegel. Professor Siegel, thank you so much for joining us. So you started writing this book in the middle of the pandemic, and here we are thinking we might, would be out of it, and we're not. You know, how do companies navigate, you know, one day, one hour, it's one thing, and the next hour, it's something different? Well, I think we saw over the last three, four, five years that every company was having to blend digital and physical because every product is connected. And the pandemic only accelerated that. I mean, even in education, we had to become experts in how to teach on Zoom overnight. And I think this is going to be with us on an ongoing basis. You'll see incumbent companies have to bring in digital capabilities and disrupting companies have to understand what it's like to function in the real world. So there are companies like, you know, Google, Apple, Uber pushing back the return to work. There are companies that are mandating mask mandates, mandating vaccinations, excuse me, like Facebook, like Google. Should companies be mandating vaccines well, at this point? Is that the only way this is going to change? Right now, it appears that the Delta variant is actually hitting most people who are unvaccinated. And if the government isn't going to be able to do it, perhaps the only way that we'll be able to do it is that the private sector will have to force its people to get vaccinated if they want to come in. And they'll figure out how to blend who's in the office and who's not in the office. So this blending of digital and physical is going to be with us going forward. One thing that I think is missing in a lot of the messaging is talk about kids under 12 who can't be vaccinated. And so even if you are vaccinated, there's a concern that you're taking, you know, whatever exposure you have at the office or on transport to the office back to your families. Like, how should companies be balancing all of that? I know they want people to get back to work, but it's scary for a lot of families. Well, they're going to have to be open to the needs of their employees. Right? You know, if people who have young children, you have children. I see it on my colleagues at Stanford who have young children. It's really, really hard if you're worried about are you going to get your kids sick? Will the kids you know, end up spreading it to other people as well? So you'll see people, I think, take a more conservative view, which will slow the, you know, us getting back to the other side of what we hope will be a time when it's back to normal when we're all out in public. There are the definitely people who are dying to get back to the office and mm -hmm. there are other people who are <laughs> I, I, honestly on both sides. I find people who want to go back and are resentful that their companies are pushing back their returns to work and others who are resentful that they feel that look like their employers don't understand, you know, that they you know would like to stay home until this is truly over, which it's not. How do companies strike that balance and what's going to separate the companies that get this right from the companies that get this wrong? I think the best companies will, you know, employ what I talk about in the book, the, the amygdala, you know, empathy towards their employees and understand that different employees are going to need different things. People with young families are going to have to deal with health care. They're going to have to deal with child care and you're going to have to create opportunities for them to be able to participate. Similarly, people who want to be able to come back in the office, maybe they're single, maybe they're younger. They like the social aspects that come from work. You want to be able to allow that to happen and to do so safely. Companies are going to need to be flexible and they're going to need to know how to blend digital and physical together. LinkedIn has called this the great reshuffle that's happening right now where, you know, if employees aren't happy with what they're getting at work, they're going to go elsewhere and, you know, they'll find a place that meets their needs and desires. You know, describe how you see that playing out. Like, are we at a turning point where in a year, in five years, we're going to look back on this moment in work history and see the workforce has been forever changed? Well, our species is social. We actually like being together. I mean, you and I can sit here together and have this conversation. It is better than on Zoom. On the other hand, you're going to have to enable flexibility. And I think flexibility is the key word. And companies that aren't flexible will lose talent. And as my colleague Jeff Immelt likes to say, <laughs> talent is destiny. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you're not able to provide an environment where people have options and have choices, labor will go elsewhere. What about the, sometimes I think the, um, you know, the, the qualities of individual and independent work are undervalued. There are, there's a lot of creative inspiration that can happen individually. There's different kinds of work that, that can happen when you are alone uh, and have uninterrupted time. How should companies um, take that into account? Because well, some, it's, I, I feel like there's a, there can be or should be a balance of both. 
Well, in the old days, you know, in the, in the technology sector, Microsoft believed every engineer should have a door so they could enter the flow and they'd enter <laughs> five or exit five or six hours later with all the code they wrote. And now when people are side by side, you know, in desks, if you're an introvert, for example, that's not always the most productive place to be. Mm -hmm. And again, this comes back to flexibility. Companies are going to need to be able to understand sometimes people need quiet time, they need concentration time, and maybe being in the office is not necessary. All right. Robert Siegel, Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, new book out. Take a look. The, brawn, the Brains and Brawn Company. Um, right there on the screen. There you see it. All right. Coming up. Need groceries delivered to your door in super fast time? There's an app for that. In fact, quite a few. We're going to look into the industry that's exciting both VCs and customers alike. This is Bloomberg. Here in the U.S., getting Whole Foods delivered to your door, about to get pricier depending on where you live. Amazon is tacking on a $9.95 service fee for deliveries in the Boston and Chicago areas, as well as Manchester, New Hampshire, Portland, Maine, and Providence, Rhode Island. When Amazon bought the organic grocer back in 2017, it offered free delivery for orders over $35. A spokesperson says the new fee helps cover operating costs without increasing food prices. And Amazon has a lot of competition when it comes to grocery delivery, of course. In recent months, we've seen a raft of companies around the world promising to courier necessities straight to your door in ultra-fast time. The growing industry has the support of big-name backers. But just how lucrative can it be? Bloomberg Opinions' Alex Webb explains. Is venture capital going to kill your neighborhood convenience store? Since the pandemic forced people into lockdown, New York, London and Berlin have been flooded with rapid grocery services like Get Here, Gorillas and GoPuff. They operate from so-called dark stores, small warehouses in cheap locations away from the high street, and promise to deliver a six pack of beer, bag of Doritos or a raw steak to your front door for as little as 10 minutes after you order from their app. But is this just another case of venture capitalists putting billions into businesses that are never going to turn a meaningful profit? Giles Thorne, an equity analyst with Jefferies, took an innovative approach to finding out. He's previously worked as a courier for Uber Eats and Deliveroo to get a sense of how their businesses worked. This time, he and his team set up camp outside a Getir dark store in London and set about counting how many orders it got. The idea was, if you turned up at a dark store because all orders are being fulfilled from a single spot, you just need to go to that spot and count the number of people on bikes cycling out with backpacks on to have a pretty good idea that that was a proxy for an order. And if you spend enough time, if you spend a day, if you spent a week, you can actually build a pretty robust view of what the daily order count was. And Getty was getting a lot more orders than he expected. Just six months after opening, the store was averaging 340 orders per day. Depending on the size of each order, each store could therefore conservatively be making between $4 million and $6 million a year in revenue, he estimates. That could be even more if basket sizes are bigger. We know from some of the commentary out of the private operators, the Pure Play Dark Store private operators, that basket sizes are comfortably north of 20 euros and trending towards 30 euros. That let him estimate that an established dark store could make an operating profit that represents between 5% and 10% of sales. That compares favorably with convenience stores, which typically enjoy a profit margin of between 2% and 4%. The model can be more profitable because it has some lower costs. It doesn't need premium real estate locations to attract the passing customer, so rent is cheaper. And each store can cover quite a wide area of around 11 square kilometers, so you need fewer locations. But setting up does require a lot of money, at least $1.4 million per store, according to Thorne. The last generation of rapid growth consumer investments were platforms, three-sided marketplaces like Uber, Lyft, or Airbnb that connected a customer with someone offering a product or service and took a percentage cut. In theory, it's a business model that doesn't require much investment because you're acting as little more than a catalyst. But in reality, the low barriers to entry have made competition tough and marketing costs high. If you're a dark grocery operator, you're really only competing for the customer. If you're Uber Eats or Deliveroo, you're competing on three fronts, for the customer, for the best restaurants, and for couriers, all of whom might find a better deal with one of your rivals. 
The initial outlay for Dark Souls is higher, but once it's up and running, it should be more efficient. Firstly, these companies are burning money on marketing to attract new customers. That's fine for now. They've raised $3 billion from investors this year alone as venture capitalists determined that the pandemic-induced lockdowns were accelerating e-commerce trends. But it's clearly not sustainable for a city like London to have a dozen different ultra-fast delivery companies. At some stage, some will go under or be acquired by their rivals. Finally, and perhaps most significantly, will the growth trend survive the lockdowns? When people are working from home, they can place dark store orders throughout the day. But if they return to the office and orders become concentrated in the evenings, the business case may not add up as readily. Besides, it's easier for commuters to pop into the corner store on their way home. It's pretty clear, however, that dark stores are here to stay. The irony is that if everyone decides it's an attractive business, supermarkets and venture capitalists alike will continue to pile into the space and the ensuing price war will mean it ceases to be an attractive business. It'll be good for the consumer, but your local bodega might find that its lunch is being eaten by someone else. This is Alex Webb for Bloomberg Quick Take in London. Alex Webb there in London. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you join us tomorrow. We're going to be joined by Linda Finley Koslowski, CEO of Blue Apron, and the CFO of Match Group, Gary Swindler. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.